Howdy, how's it going? My name's Davy Shappy, and I like butt stuff. You know who else likes butt stuff? The Greeks. And you know who likes the Greeks? Pretty much every nerd that has ever tried to act like they have a perfect memory of Greek mythology, but really they just read the Percy Jackson series and did a quick Google search. And some of those nerds must have been working at Wizards of the Coast, because in 2013 we saw the introduction of a new world crafted specifically for D&D's sister game, Magic the Gathering. And the name of that world was Theros. Today I'm going to be giving an overview of what you can find in the newly released book, The Mythic Odysseys of Theros, as well as a rundown on the new subclasses and races that Theros hid underneath its toga. As always, keep in mind that a lot of this is just my opinion, so if you feel like the Percy Jackson series went on for way too long and definitely lost its steam somewhere during the Mark of Athena, then feel free to play your games however you like. Also, quick side note, due to the unspeakable curse plaguing our lands, the Mythic Odysseys of Theros is only available on digital marketplaces right now. I actually went to my local game store just to be sure, and the store clerk there, who clearly did not understand that I was YouTube famous, actually had the gall to tell me that he didn't have it takedown video coming soon. But with that out of the way, let's begin! And real quick, I want to give a brief shout out to my new patrons this month. Quietly, because my roommate is asleep in the next room. Osmer Walken, Naked and Afraid, Edward Jake Fermalo, Jack Jokat. Thank you so much for pledging to my Patreon. With your help and a little luck, I just might move out. So, Theros is a fantastical world of heroes, prophecies, gods, and divine fates that weave it all together. Taking heavy inspiration from the stories of the First Enlighteners, Theros had a fascination with the stars and the sky, as well as the gods that resided within them. Constellations weren't just a map by which an astrologist could read the stories of ancient heroes, but they were in fact living aspects of the Old One's wills that would come down to Earth and give you these hands for staring too much. Fun fact, Theros was actually my first set when I started playing the Magic the Gathering, and now, seven years later, long after I decided that magic was dumb and overexpensive for not enough emotional payoff, it seems that Theros has finally strangled enough Spriggans to track me down to my new home. Though it has managed to appear all over my social media, and it now knows where I live, Theros comes bearing gifts, which totally makes up for it. These gifts come in the form of new races and subclasses, although I say new very loosely, considering over half the races are copypastas of older books, as well as new magic items, including the weapons of the five main gods of Theros, and a huge section going over locations in Theros and how you could run a successful adventure when you come across that area. Much like how the Explorer's Guide to Wildmount had adventure suggestions for all of its locations. I'm really glad that they're making this a trend, because those random adventure suggestions were one of my favorite things from the Wildmount book, and they're just as fun here. Honestly, I don't even like Theros that much as a setting, but I can still rip these adventure hooks off the page and stick them into my own homebrew games no problem, so this is great! There's also a decently sized bestiary featuring creatures from the realm of myths and monsters, including the Aberrant Overlord, a creature I swear I remember being in the Ravnica set first, but whatever. Or a Rasta of the Endless Whelb. The most terrifying product of someone's dark repressed spider psyche, dear god, get that thing away from me! But I know what it is you're really here for, so there's no point in beating around the bush. The new races of Theros are a little lackluster. See, you got the Centaur and the Minotaur, which are reprints from the last Magic the Gathering spin-off of the Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica. Then there's the Triton, making a return from Volo's Guide, and apparently it's gotten older now because it has somehow copied all of the exact same stats, plus Dark Vision, thereby continuing the trend of giving half the races in the game the power to see in the dark. I won't reread what the abilities of all these races do. I did a video on both of those books, so you can find them there, and I don't want to encourage wizards' behavior of reprinting old material in new books just because the Adventurers League is forceful about the PHP plus one rule. But I will talk about the actual new races in this book, those being the Leonin and the Satyr, as well as the new subclasses, the College of Eloquence for the Bard, and the Oath of Glory for the Paladin. The Leonin is a mighty lionfolk creature, not unlike the Tabaxi, but much bigger and more likely to be turned into a muscle boy than a cat girl. They have their own unique language that no one will ever use, and so I would actually suggest giving it to the tabaxi as well, so that there's at least some variance in the likelihood of speaking meow. As a lion -o, you will get bonuses to strength and con, an increased speed of 35 feet, dark vision, the choice and proficiency between athletics, intimidation, perception, and survival, a natural weapon in the form of basic claws just like the tabaxi, and a bite-sized, frightful presence ability called the Daunting Roar, which scares the bejeebies out of people stupid enough to charge a full-grown lion man. As far as abilities go, the Leonin is a perfectly normal race that will honestly probably probably be forgotten about in favor of its more dexterous cousin, especially since people get weirded out by source books from different settings. However, the same cannot be said for the Satyr! I don't know why, but everyone and their mother that I talked to was so excited for the Satyr, and I am too! Satyrs shaved from the waist up and draped in beauty is my aesthetic. For those of you who don't know, per Greek mythology, Satyrs are an exclusively male species of forest creature that is known for being horrendously ugly, lusting after nymphs in a very unhealthy way, and having an absolutely massive way! But as far as Theros is concerned, anybody 
can be a satyr, they're super big about partying and having a good time, and they're considered fey, not humanoids, which continues to spite me, but I'm still not gonna let it stop my goat boy role-playing fantasies. When you're a satyr, you get bonuses to charisma and dex. Hmm, I wonder what class this is meant to be. An increased movement speed, proficiency in performance and persuasion skills. Hmm, I wonder what class this is meant to be. And proficiency in an instrument of your choice. <laughs> a strength-based ram attack, a jump like Kobe, and a natural resistance to all magical effects. Now, that last bit has people decrying the satyr as overpowered, but honestly, I don't agree. I think the main reason why people are freaking out is because the Yaunty have the same ability, and Yaunty are busted as all get out, but the snakes also have innate poison resistance, innate spells that they can cast, and the magic resistance, while the satyr can resist magic and jump higher? Sure, it also gets proficiencies, but that's not enough to call the satyr anything but just a good race that isn't gonna break the game by picking it. Feel free to party any way you want. And speaking of class, and bards, and being overpowered, the College of Eloquence is all three by managing to be the bardiest bard that ever held a neck of wood. The concept of the College of Eloquence is that of an oratory speaker, telling the legends and teaching the wisdom of the great epics, of tales, of heroes, of might and magic, all the while absolutely shredding on a sick harp solo. The main reason why Eloquence is so chonky is that its very first ability makes it so that the bard cannot, under any circumstances, roll lower than a 10 on both persuasion and deception checks. A 9 or lower immediately becomes a 10, including the all-dreadful natural 1. Which I know technically doesn't do anything for skill checks, but no one cares about that. Beyond that, the Eloquence can use their bardic inspiration to inhibit an enemy's saving throw. It gets two special abilities at level 6 instead of the industry standard of 1. The first giving your friends back any bardic inspiration die that fails to help them, and the second giving bards the ability to magically compel people to understand them. And finally, in case that wasn't enough, the capstone lets bards use a reaction to give somebody a free bardic inspiration whenever someone successfully uses their bardic inspiration, an amount of times up to their charisma mod. That is a lot of bard. There's so much bard in this bard. This isn't your dad's bard, this is your daddy's bard. I don't need to tell you that giving a bard a floor of 10 on persuasion is dumb. Although at least they didn't give it to a class that has expertise in skills- OH WAIT! And you can bet that this bard is going to have the unfortunate side effect of keeping DM stingy with when they can actually allow people to roll dice, which is the opposite of what you want in a game about rolling dice! But I digress. Finally, the Oath of Glory Paladin is what happens when you want to play a fighter, but you don't want to be one of those lamos without magic, so you pick the next best thing. The Oath of Glory brings out the strong, athletic gladiator hero that is Achilles, Hercules, Larry the Lobster, and Dabby Chabby. But are the abilities equally as sexy? Well, for starters, your channel divinity can be used as a literal steroid to swollify your athletics and physical might, and it can also be used to augment your smites, granting your allies temporary HP when you hit an enemy with the Wrath of the Gods. From there, you get a tiny five-foot aura of alacrity that speeds up your allies as they charge into battle alongside you, and that aura eventually grows into an ever-impressive 10 feet. You can also use your reaction to block incoming strikes meant for your allies and counterattack if the strike was deflected, and your 20th level capstone nets you the power of the gods, making you naturally charming, giving you auto-hits, and letting you reroll saving throws because you're just that damn amazing. As a subclass, the Oath of Glory is fun, but it really lacks the offensive oomph required to make it shine as the ultimate superman of the paladins. That aura ability is laughable, and the channel divinities will have very limited use leaving your most valuable abilities at levels 15 and 20. Not a great look. It's ironic that the subclass that endeavored to be the greatest hero in all of mythology ended up being the lamest zero. But that'll about do it. I hope you enjoyed this video. Be sure to share it around, check out my social media in the description below, and maybe support me on Patreon so that I can buy a history book and stop mixing up Greek and Roman mythology. But yeah, Davy out.